Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Vince Power, Chris Benito, Steve Iadarola, and brand new patrons, Dorindus and Leah. Everybody welcome Yay! Dorindus and Leah. Woo! Woo! On this episode of DTNS, ChatGPT is not nearly as well known as you might think. Sarah tells us why the EV market ain't done yet. And Charlotte Henry is here to explain what the heck Netflix is up to after getting the NFL and saying, yeah, we don't want to be HBO anymore. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 28th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Joining us from the Addition newsletter, Charlotte Henry, welcome back. Hello, hello. I hope you all had a lovely holiday weekend. We did. Did you have a lovely holiday weekend? I did. I did. I had a very nice long weekend until right the last few hours when I managed to play football bracket soccer i managed to really do my wrist in uh, um, but was it worth it did you win uh yes i think so who needs oh, yeah. a wrist <laughs> yeah it turns yeah. out me typing but Wait, wrists are replaceable aren't they yeah. maybe soon i mean i don't know they're nice to is it, have but... is it stopping me talk to you not at no. all so yeah. we're fine <laughs> yeah. there we go. there go that's all we need all right let's start with the quick hits on Tuesday, Google announced several AI-powered features for its Chromebook Plus laptops, including a system-wide writing assistant called Help Me Write, Magic Editor in Photos, Wallpaper Creator, and integration of the Gemini chatbot. The Gemini icon will now appear on the up shelf. New Chromebook Plus buyers also get a year of Google One AI Premium included. There's also four new Chromebook models, uh, Plus models from HP and Asus, and Acer. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia has set the schedule for hearing ByteDance's case against the United States law that would require the company to divest itself of TikTok in the U.S. or face a ban on the distribution of its app. The law would require divestment by January 19th, so that's our deadline. Uh, all sides asked for an accelerated schedule, and here's the schedule they got. Legal briefs are due by June 20th from ByteDance. Then the defendant, the United States Department of Justice, gets till July 26th to do their briefs. Reply briefs, once you get to read everybody else's, are then due by August 15th, and that gives you time to start oral arguments in September with the target date for a decision no later than December 6th. Now, given that December 6th is before January 19th, and even considering that the Supreme Court is probably going to be asked to review whatever decision is made, TikTok has decided not to ask for a preliminary injunction at this point. Maybe thinking that'll put a little pressure on things. I don't know. Cha-ching for those lawyers. No. Yeah. Well, speaking of pressure, the YouTube ad blocker war is continuing. Many ad blockers users are reporting that if YouTube detects an ad blocker that they might be using, it may skip to the end of videos or even mute the video altogether. This mostly seems to be affecting Adblock Plus users. That's a well-known ad blocker. And several have already found workarounds. As New one Atlas does. <laughs> new Atlas reports on a new meta material uh, called the polymer based microphotonic multifunction meta, meta material or PMMM. P -M -M -M. It can be used to let light through walls and roofs without heating things up on the inside or even letting you see. It's, it's confusing because it's very transparent but it also diffracts so it looks frosted, so it lets light through, but doesn't let you see through, if that makes any sense. The film is etched with a pattern of pyramids that are 10 microns wide. It scatters 73% of the light that makes it look frosted, but is still 95% transparent, so the light eventually gets through, and that's actually more transparent than glass. Glass is only 91%. It provides passive cooling with radiative cooling and is super hydrophobic, so water just beats up and rolls right off, taking the dirt and dust with it. So they're self-cleaning windows as well. Scientists from the University of Michigan worked with Apple to collect data from 160,000 willing participants to study tinnitus, aka the ringing that sometimes happens in your ears. Some people have this chronically. 77.7% .7 of participants had experienced this at some point in their lives, and daily occurrence increased with age. 
male participants increased uh, tinnitus 2.7% more than females, but a higher percentage of males also said they had never experienced it at all. Noise trauma or exposure to excessively high noise levels were cited by 20.3% of participants as the cause, and that's the highest percentage of any single category. Yeah. Another example of, of Apple yeah, trying to know, help uh, research know, scientists. Construction work, I can only imagine. Yeah. Musicians, concert yeah, goers. Yeah, that's yeah. Airpods in your ear. Airpods yeah. in your ears a lot. Yeah. Although <laughs> no, Apple was pointing out like that uh, uh, AirPods imagine. have volume limiting and noise cancellation, so they can actually help cut down yeah, on and, tinnitus. And so. also Apple does, I, I'm, you know, just to overcome my quip, Apple does also obviously have lots of noise limiting features that it takes yeah. quite seriously. Indeed, indeed. All right, let's talk about whether people actually know about AI. See, you all hear us talk about it all the time. You probably read about it on your own all the time. So you're out there going like, man, ChatGPT is everybody everywhere. And everybody knows about ChatGPT. But the folks at the Reuters Institute teamed up with Oxford University to find out if that was true of the general populace. They surveyed, surveyed 12,000 people in six countries across three, four continents about their habits with new AI tools like ChatGPT. Around 50% of those surveyed had heard about ChatGPT, and 20 to 30% had not heard of any of the most popular tools. About 28% of the people they surveyed said they had used tools like ChatGPT to create content like text or images or video or code, et cetera. 24% uh, used them to get information and I know what you're thinking, like, oh, great, they're getting a bunch of fake news. Only 5% of the people surveys used them to get news. So it was information like, you know, why do I have this bump on my wrist uh, versus, you know, uh, what happened <laughs> yeah. with the sports game yeah. yesterday? Yeah. Uh, the survey found 7% of people in the U.S. used it every day. Uh, while that number was lower in other countries. So not a lot of people using this every day. In fact, Japan was the lowest country surveyed with only 1% of the people they surveyed saying they use these kinds of tools at least once a day. 56% of the folks 18 to 24, though, said they have used ChatGPT at least once, and that's compared to 16% of those aged 55 and over. Uh, so it does seem like the younger folks in the survey we're more likely to have used these or used them more frequently than the older folks in the survey. Uh, Charlotte, this this just tracks as as an early adopter uh, manifestation to me. Like, yes, yeah. AI is is taking over the mind share, but use wise, it's like in a, a first generation iPhone. Uh, yeah, that's all true. Um, the Reuters Institute, by the way, is a really interesting body. It's part of Oxford University. They do really interesting works on tech and media and stuff. So I've sort of come across their work a few times, and they're very interesting people. Um, I was surprised when you said it was as high as 7%, mm. because I think, as you were basically just saying, Tom, those of us in tech who follow tech, who cover tech, kind of assume everyone is using these tools all the time. And actually, for most people, they're just these things I occasionally hear about on podcasts or in the news when people are freaking out about them. So I'm not surprised it's low. Um, I, w I don't know if there's uh, name recognition data because I suspect quite a few people recognize the name ChatGPT, for example. But yeah, I think it just shows what a long way we've got uh, to go for mainstream adoption of these. My caveat to that, of course, is there are lots of instances where people are using AI and maybe not know they are. So, you know, contact a chatbot through get customer service or something. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. AI overviews is coming to more people. So a lot of more people will be exposed to it in Google than were before right. when you had to opt in to get it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But it, I think it shows, yeah, as I say, I think it kind of shows that there is some kind of breakthrough, but equally, we're going to have to wait a long time for it to be this mainstream, all-encompassing thing. And a lot of the freakouts that we've seen over the last what year, six months, sixteen, are you know not quite what we need to do yet because you know people are still not incorporating them into their day-to-day -day lives in the way people think they might be. Well, and I think I think to your point, Charlotte. I mean, I think that's a big part of this. Is you know you've got the younger set saying, "Yeah, I've used chat." 
GPT at least once and older people sure. saying, no, I never have. Um, well, the younger set is probably still in school <laughs> in some capacity. Maybe you're not. But I mean, if you are and you're trying to, you know, find a tool to make you a better student, you know, and or not have to work as hard, uh, you know, this this is a great use case. Now, we we talk about this on the show all the time. And, you know, anybody who uses any of these large language models know that there are limitations and sometimes, you know, the hallucinations make things weird. You can't use this as your own brain. But I think younger people are more willing to say like, well, but if I could, I'd like to try. Well, let me poke around and find out what it is good for, right? Like, yeah. let, let, let me try it. Whereas uh, as I've gotten older, I have less time in my day, maybe because I'm slower, maybe because I'm just getting less flexible to try things out. I'm, I just want to do the things that I know work. Uh, and I and I think that's, that's true of a, of a lot of people. I also know that of all the people I talk to, the people who tell me most excited that they use this the most often are people using it for code. It is very useful for code. Uh, I have a lot of people tell me that this is stuff's going to keep getting better and better and better. If it follows the pattern of most, te most technology, it's about to reach the top of its bell curve. And that's when we'll start pounding away and figuring out what it's good for and what it's not. But right now we're still in that experimental phase. And the majority of the populace doesn't want the experimental phase, right? They don't want to be the first person with an iPhone that doesn't even have 3G or apps. They want to be the person with the iPhone 5 down the road where all the kinks have been worked out. And also most people don't need to be engaged with it in the experimental phase. You, yeah, you know, it's, it's, of no it's not going to help it's them, more, right? It's more trouble than it's worth. I, I, just back to my point about people using AI without necessarily learning, because when we talk about AI, we mean things like chat GPT, um, and that's what the survey was about, particularly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, some of the image Gemini, generating tools. You know, yeah, the idea. Gemini and that, some of the image generating tools. That is your assistant. Correct. But there's also things, you know, I would have answered no in this survey, but I use an AI tool every day because I have Grammarly installed to try and stop me making horrible spell check errors. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and I, mean, I think it's cool it, that that is an AI tool. Yeah. And uh, probably most people will experience their use of AI in that way. Like it'll right. just show up in something they already use. Google Docs, Microsoft Office, Teams, whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, and and Grammarly uh, and, is a great example of that. Yeah. And so my point is just because they're answering no to this survey for reasons I think you've pointed out, Tom, that doesn't mean they're not actually using AI in other ways that are useful to them and much more straightforward. Yeah. It doesn't mean the generative models aren't useful. It just means it's not a customer choice per se. It's a feature yeah. coming into the stuff they use. Yeah. Uh, and that there are other tools within the sphere of AI that are useful already. Yeah. Uh, speaking of new tools and future proofing against them, Tuesday, OpenAI announced it had created a new safety and security committee to oversee all the aspects of development of new models. The committee is made up of OpenAI board members Brett Taylor, Adam D'Angelo, Nicole Seligman, and board member and CEO Sam Altman. The group will spend 90 days evaluating OpenAI's processes and safeguards and update the board with its findings. A longer-term risk assessment group was recently disbanded at OpenAI. AI. You may have heard about that after its two main leaders, Ilya Sutskever and Jan Leike, left OpenAI. So they, they've got a new, more near-term looking risk assessment team in place. All right. So yeah. let's check in with uh, electric vehicles, also known as EVs. Uh, you might have heard sales overall flat in the first quarter. Oh, nobody wants to buy an EV anymore. Big companies like Ford, GM did scale back expansion plans. Tesla laid off 10% of its global workforce might lead you to think, oh, the EV market has really slowed. However, six of the 10 biggest EV makers in the U.S. saw sales grow, 56% at Hyundai, Kia, and even 86% at Ford itself, just depending on the EV that it was selling. This points to consumers who want affordable pricing, they want good battery range, lots of charging options, all things that were hindrances to, you know, potential EV uh, owners in the past. Stephanie valdez Streety, who is the director and industry uh, in, uh, of Industry Insights at Cox Automotive, tells Bloomberg, of the market right now, quote, 
we're still seeing growth in demand, just not the same pace for every brand. Right now, Tesla doesn't have new models. Ford doesn't have a lot in the pipeline. But Hyundai, BMW, Kia, Cadillac, they're really moving the needle forward. Okay, so overall, in the U.S., EV sales in the first quarter grew a respectable 23% year over year, matching pace with global EV sales for the same period. So what is up with all the people saying, oh, nobody wants an EV anymore? Charlotte, I know you're, you're not in the U.S., but, you know, you know, kind of looking at some global numbers here, what, what do you think is up? Yeah, I mean, first of all, people do want electric vehicles. Second of all, uh, governments want people to get involved in electric vehicles. Um, but, you know, you were talking about the cars and, you know, this brand doesn't have a new model and so on and so forth. Um, I haven't got my Cybertruck yet. It's still on order. I don't really know where it is. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I would love to see you know, these things are not like, you know, an iPhone where you upgrade them the whole time, right? There's a point where the people who want an electric car have done their upgrade and they're going to wait a few years for the next part of the cycle. So it doesn't necessarily surprise me that there's been sort of spikes and troughs in these sales. You know, people have had a diff difficult time financially. Probably the thing they don't need to invest in is a new vehicle. So, so the data you were laying off doesn't necessarily surprise me. Um, I was saying to you off air, I wasn't like, oh, isn't the big thing, I don't drive, but I was, isn't the big thing for people thinking of making a move to electric uh, the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure. Now, I know there's yeah. been big moves in the US. I think probably there still needs to be more done here, although there is being progress in the UK on that. And that, to me, is surely the biggest barrier for people. I mean, there was a time where if you weren't an owner of a Tesla, um, right. you couldn't use a supercharging station. Um, that uh, That has changed. That has opened up a lot of, you know, sort of cross-country or just kind of longer road uh, situations for a lot of uh, EV drivers as well. Um, there are, I, I think in the US, the news gets skewed a bit because to this day, I mean, it was sort of like Chevy, Tesla, mm. maybe a little, you know, you got the Ford, you know, lightning stuff. Like there wasn't a lot going on. So the fact that there are many other automakers in the market right now who are doing good stuff at an affordable price, you have more charging opportunities, batteries are better than ever. Um, the the news tends to be like, oh, I think things are really bad. Look at Tesla. It's like, well, Tesla used to be the only name in the game, and now it's right. not. Yeah. Tesla yeah. is by far the largest seller of EVs. So when they have a drop, that makes all the headlines. But let's repeat what Sarah said. Sales in the first quarter grew 23% year over year. So we're not talking about a slowdown. There isn't a slowdown in EV no. sales. There's there is an increase certain in EVs. Factors. Yeah, it's that yeah. They, everyone's buying a Hyundai <laughs> and an Ionic, uh, and that doesn't make for flashy headlines because it doesn't involve a controversial CEO or anything like that. Uh, but yeah. but it's Tesla, the market leader, doesn't have a new model out. Their sales are slowing. That's really not that unusual for a market leader to, to hit a skid as everybody starts to get back into the game. Uh, it was interesting to see GM have a slowdown, but they have a bunch of models in the hopper and they're expected to have sales pick up. Uh, Ford is expected to slow down, but they had a really good Q1. This, to me, if you look at these graphs, looks like a competitive market. It's certainly a competitive market. I was pleased you mentioned the uh, quote unquote controversial CEO because I, I slightly wonder if some of that is playing into it as well. Uh, you know, we can read we can read too much into these things can't we those of us that spend too much yeah time it's hard it's hard to tell if there's any actual sales impact of of people's do beliefs people, <laughs> yeah or not yeah do yeah. people just want to not have the elon musk car i yeah, wonder right. how much of an effect that's having. you know but there's certainly I, plenty of people buying lots of other evs so that 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 is true no matter what tesla's competitors what? have got better as well yeah we really have to remember that I also, you know, not that everybody needs an SUV because, uh, you know, it's uh, certainly you don't. But they're but popular. That's what people buy. They're right? popular. I have one. You know, I it would be hard for me to go back. But, um, you know, when I was like in high school, like 
a Chevy Blazer was the coolest car I could ever imagine. Did I have one? Of course not. But the idea that there's like a Chevy Blazer EV in the pipeline, you know, I mean. It caught your it, eye, right? Yeah. It did. It really yeah. did. I mean, some of this is like, you know, in a way, I, I feel like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> like nostalgic cars that are getting new year life. Old yeah, exactly. Buzzing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, not that they won't, you know, be bought otherwise, but yeah, I, I'm into it. <laughs> um, I'm also into a little show called Apple Vision Show. Have you heard of it? Uh, I have. <laughs> I have. Tom, Charlotte, you have. Maybe some of you out there have, or if you haven't, um, this is the show where Eileen Rivera and I host um, a weekly podcast to talk about what's going on with Apple, what we like, what we want, um, is the company doing the things that we as consumers want? Um, it's the Apple Vision Show. Get it? Get it? Um, so <laughs> we had a really, really fun conversation with Scott Johnson that was on our previous episode. Um, it was really, really fun. We're also uh, actually, for anybody who likes to uh, join the live stream, we are recording our show right after today's GDI. So if you want to hang out between us and Android, uh, between <laughs> GDI and Android Faithful, Apple Vision Show will be there. Uh, get subscribed, applevisionshow.com. It is time again for additional conversations on DTNS, where we talk to Charlotte Henry about some of the greatest things going on in the world of media and technology. Uh, New York Times interview over the weekend talked to Netflix co-CEO Ted Sarandos, who said he regrets saying that famous quote back in 2013 to GQ, the goal is to become HBO faster than HBO can become us. It was a very snappy quote. People have been quoting it ever since. Uh, but Sarandos now says... He wants Netflix to become the next CBS, the next BBC, saying that prestige elite programming is a, quote, very small business. He didn't say it was unimportant. He said it's just very small. And then Netflix is bigger than that. Similar sentiment is expressed by Angela Watercutter in a Wired article called Netflix Isn't About Flicks Anymore. Mm -hmm. Watercut argues that movie catalogs and replacing cinemas aren't what Netflix and other streaming services are about. Instead, they are focused on becoming traditional TV networks. Kind of goes along with what Serendos told the New York Times. Uh, serialized shows, ad-supported tiers, live sports. She added that YouTube, the top streaming service per hour is watched, is focusing on younger viewers with short-form content and their creators. Meanwhile, and, and Netflix just went and got the NFL at least a couple of games a year uh, on Christmas Day. Uh, Charlotte, you watch this space really closely. Uh, wh what what do you make of this? I thought it was fascinating because, as you said, it's such a famous quote from Ted Sarandos, isn't it? Th that comment. Uh, that, so that was the first thing I thought. The second thing I thought was, well, Apple TV Plus is now the HBO of the yeah. streaming world. No, that's very, that very, uh, very apt comparison. That was that was my <laughs> second thought. Um, and my third thought was, yeah, they're definitely not doing live news. Too many complications, too much politics, too much. It's too difficult. Um, you and I, Tom, have discussed on both of our shows how reticent Netflix has been to get into live sports. And then it turned up with the NFL. Um, but it's still kind of dipping its toe in, right? It's such a big commitment, live sports. It's so complicated. You so can't get it wrong. Um, if you're broadcasting live sport. Uh, I think, I don't know if I've told the story on here about the time Amazon Prime Video, the first time it got Premier League football here. Mm. Um, and it was fine, but there was a problem because there was delays. People, Your friends who you were WhatsApping during the game had seen stuff 30 seconds previously that you might not have. Mm -hmm. I, live sport is complicated and I'm not sure Netflix needs it to be as successful as it is. You know, maybe great dipping its toe in a bit um, to keep, you know, shareholders and whatever happy. But I think Netflix kind of is doing its thing and has always avoided live sport. Obviously, that we also, you, we didn't really get mentioned earlier, but the WWE, Netflix has gone really big in on that, hasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
which yeah, is, so it- I think, quite a clever way of doing it. I'm not a WWE fan, but it's a mix of live sport and entertainment that kind of works, I think, in the Netflix sphere. Netflix always said, uh, if we do live sports, we want to control it. We we don't want to be paying a lot of money to these big organizations. Uh, And then they went and they got the NFL anyway. Again, like you say, it's limited. It's dipping a toe. It's just a couple of games, three-year deal. WWE, Worldwide Wrestling Entertainment, feels more like what they were talking about, which is, you know, we can work very closely with them. Uh, We can broadcast almost all of their content worldwide, even if we don't have all of it in every market. and, and so I was really shocked when they did the NFL, but it does go with Watercutter's theory of they're trying to be mainstream broadcast television, you know, uh, widely appealing sitcoms, things for all members of the family, live sports. And I know, I know you you alluded to Serendos saying, yeah, we're not really going to get into breaking news, but they said we weren't going to do live sports with the oh. NFL. They said they weren't going to do ads. They said they weren't going to do crackdowns on passwords. Uh, frankly, when he said that, I was like, oh, they're doing news within the next two Tom, years is, is kind of Tom, what that means. <laughs> you are a very wise man. You have watched the internet for very many years. I'm I'm going to have a bet with you live on this show that Netflix does not do live news. They've done like live comedy, haven't they? They did like topical comedy shows and it got really difficult. Some territories. But live comedy isn't, you know, I mean, it's kind of cool if it's live and it works out. But like, that's not news. Well, I'm thinking of like daily shows, like topical Uh comedy. Like yeah. it's complicated. I, I would be amazed if they bothered to spend the time yeah. doing live news. And as I'm saying it, I'm now imagining the nightly news with <laughs> everything you, you said know, is true. Welcome back, Don Lemon. Net- Netflix could do it in a way nobody else can because they're in every market. No one else is in every market. They could have truly yeah. world news. But everything you says is true. It's too complicated. They shouldn't do it, which is what I said about live sports. It's what I said about doing ads. It's what I said about cracking down on passwords. So while I 100% agree with you, Charlotte, I will take that bet. Netflix will be doing breaking news by January 1st, 2026. 20, right. I'm so excited for the first additional All conversation right. segment of We've 2026 our- <laughs> when we're discussing our- Netflix doing live our news. Our first gamble. Whoa, <laughs> things it's got on. spicy on DTNS. Mm-hmm. We didn't say what we're betting, but that's fine. We'll worry about that later. We'll discuss it on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could bet the air. I, I mean, I have to say, you, we've sort of glibbed past it, but YouTube, no one thinks of it as a streaming service. Uh, and actually, I want to talk about more about YouTube in GDI. But YouTube on the TV mm-hmm. is, for most people, how they consume TV. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're talking about those streaming services, you have to have YouTube in there now. Yeah. Have to. Oh, I mean, YouTube TV, which I, you know, I, I pay for is, is my service. But that's a separate thing. But, but yeah. that's not even YouTube itself, yeah. which you can generate. also use as a streaming service for sure. Yeah. Right. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Churros and Palomitas wrote in about our latest Live With It episode. Uh, Last week, Rob Dunwood and I um, talked about his review of the Elgato teleprompter. For anybody who's, you know, thinking about being a podcaster or, you know, just, you know, kind of wants cool stuff, it was a great conversation. Tro says, I bought a prompter from Elgato a few months ago, and for production, it's really a time saver. The software is the weakest part of an already strong offer, but has received a couple of updates and has improved in it, it, since its release. Something I want to add, you can also use it with your Android device in combination with apps like Display Link Presenter, so it will mirror what's on your phone, the Nano Teleprompter, uh, his favorite prompter app for Android, that way, if you have to go and you don't want to take your laptop with you, then you have a lighter option for the road if needed. Thank you, Dan, uh, for for a little extra content for what was a great episode. And, and patrons yeah. know because they got it in their feed on Monday. Palomitas is Dan Campos. 
Um, uh, Bill wrote in and said, I just listened to the portion of last week's show where you talked about the headphones that can filter out everything except for the person you're looking at. As someone with ADHD, this would be amazing to have in some situations where I could be easily distracted by anything and everything going on around me. I can't begin to explain the struggle many of us have trying to concentrate on just one person when there are six other conversations going on within earshot. Loud commotions, sirens, dogs barking, etc. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good perspective on on that technology advance. Hopefully they'll be able to get it into people's ears very soon. Indeed. And both of these uh, messages came to us uh, through Patreon. Um, but just a reminder, if you have feedback for us, feedback at dailytechnewshow.com is where to send that email. I promise you, we will read it. Thank you to you, Charlotte Henry, for being with us today. Let folks know where they can keep up with your latest. Oh, it's always such a pleasure hanging out with you guys. Uh, the best, best place to keep up with me is theaddition.net. Uh, also, if you're interested in the UK election, check out the House of Comments podcast, which I also co-host. Uh, but there'll be links to that also on theaddition.net. Uh, and as well as taking out your DTNS Patreon, why not uh, take out a paid subscription to the, D uh, the Edition newsletter as well? You can get Please all stop. great stuff if you take out both. Patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet, a virtual pet that comes with the ability for you to poke it with your finger through a hole in the side of the device, comes to the U.S. this summer. What could go wrong? Yeah, okay. <laughs> if there's ever I mean, a reason that, to, let, to is, tune into GDI, today's the day. Hey, just a reminder. the time I've got to go. <laughs> we we do record DTNS live Monday through four, Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Thanks for everybody who does keep up with us live. We're back again with Scott Johnson tomorrow. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>